Hey there, this is Pat Ennis of Ennis Legacy Partners. Welcome to the Exit Readiness Podcast. I'm here with co-host Walter Dial, CPA and tax partner at GRF CPAs and Advisors in Bethesda, Maryland. And we also have with us today, uh, my business partner, Corby McGordon. Our mission here on this podcast is to provide you, the business owner, with subject matter expertise on topics pertaining to building transferable or sellable business value, and then planning for your eventual exit from the business. We want to help you build build a business that's sellable or transferable and then exit successfully on your own terms and conditions. In his book, The Boutique, author Greg Alexander describes a boutique professional services firm as being past the startup stage, but pre-scale. Examples being found in consulting, marketing, advertising, et cetera. Basically, anyone that sells their expertise, maybe even an accounting or an exit planning firm. Greg explains in the boutique how to start, scale, and then sell a professional services firm. And he's a very credible source as he's actually done it successfully, successfully, excuse me, launched, then scaled then sold his professional services firm for for nine figures. In this episode, we're going to focus on growth and scalability with the hopes of having Greg back, if he likes us uh, in the future to to discuss exit. And so our topic today is professional services firms and scalability. So let's formally introduce our guest. Greg Alexander is the founder of Collective 54, the first mastermind community for professional services firms and author of the number one best-selling book, already mentioned, The Boutique, How to Start, Scale, and Sell a Professional Services Firm. We strongly recommend uh, Greg's book. Uh, we love it. And, and, and basically, that's why we asked him to join us today. He also serves as the Chief Investment Officer for Capital 54, which is his uh, family office, where his role is deciding which entrepreneurs to bet on and which firms to invest in. Prior to both uh, Collective 54 and Capital 54, Greg spent a decade building that firm. Uh, his firm is called SBI, and then he exited successfully on his own terms and conditions. And so we're excited that he's agreed to join us today in discussing the very real challenge of scalability for professional services firms. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Greg, let, me, uh, so. let me go ahead and start. Let me ask you a question. I always think of, when I think of professional service firms, when I think of boutique, I think of, you know, a firm that has a very limited scope of services and a very high expertise in that niche area. But you, you're defining it, for your purposes, more of a size issue. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. Our, our definition of a boutique is somebody that operates in the industry code of 54. So the North American industry classification system, code 54. And there's several subcategories on the net, underneath that. You mentioned some of them, you know, consulting, IT services, marketing and advertising, law, accounting, architecture, design, et cetera, et cetera. And um, our definition is between five and 249 employees. Um, and here just in the U.S., which is our primary focus, although we do have members outside the U.S. increasingly because of the world we're living in now, you know, we can talk to anybody at any time. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's approximately 1.5 million firms that meet that criteria. And what we find intriguing about that is that only 4,116 of them, and you can tell we study this, have reached scale. Scale defined as more than 249 employees. So that's one quarter of 1%, which is actually incredible. Um, and what we're trying to help your listeners and others is understand what those, what that one quarter, 1% is doing, you know, and, and how can we, and I was one of those, thank goodness. And how can we kind of spread those best practices so others can reach their dreams and scale their firms? Yeah, that's really, it's always amazed me about the accounting profession. And I don't know the exact statistics, but it's something like, you know, in excess of 70% of all accounting firms are like less than five people. Yeah, that's right. What happens is, as you probably know, is, you know, someone's working for a big accounting firm and, and, and he or she and a couple of their buddies say, hey, we can do this on their own. They hang the shingle. Yeah. And then they get going and they're expert accountants. They deliver incredibly out, you know, high quality, outstanding work for their clients. But the, the business of running a professional services firm might not be their area of expertise. 
And it's not enough to just be a technical expert or a domain expert. You have to know how to scale these businesses. And because they're people-driven businesses, there's a very specific playbook used to scale these firms. And it's very different than a product business. And herein lies the problem. Because if you're a small business owner and you're trying to educate yourself and you're a lifelong learner and you go out into the world, what's the material that's available to you? It's non-professional services firms. It's mostly product companies. I mean, if you type in software as a service into Google, I mean, you could read the entire internet and take you 500 years to study how to be in the software business. But if you type in how to scale a professional services firm, you're probably done in a day. There's just a dearth of information there. And and that's the gap in the the hole that we're all trying to, we're trying to plug. Interesting. But there are, there are people who, and Pat, Pat and I see this a lot with some of the clients we work with, you know, it's more a lifestyle business. They don't want the hassle of, growing and adding people and things like that but you know i i think most of us at least the people that we in, interact with more regularly are really more entrepreneurial and they they want to see how far they can go you know what i find interesting about a lifestyle business is first off there's nothing wrong with a lifestyle business i mean who doesn't want a great lifestyle right so so if that's your aspiration then focusing on scale is irrelevant you know, yeah. you've got a great lifestyle and you've got a small number of clients and trusted loyal employees and, and just keep doing what you're doing. But if your aspiration expands and you want to build a firm that scales beyond you and create an asset that somebody might want to buy someday, yeah. then a lifestyle business is a prison sentence because no one is going to buy your business if it's dependent on you. It has to be more than that. And we're operating in very interesting times right now in professional services. And and I believe that we're in the golden era of professional services. And here's why. There's $2 trillion spent per year in the category. $2 trillion. It's the second largest sector in the world now, trailing only oil and gas. There's an organic growth rate of 5.5%, which is incredible. That's Mm. two to to three times GDP. Um, So it's a growth industry. So why is that? Well, all of our business models, corporations, their business models are being disrupted through digital technology, globalization, the pandemic, you, you pick it. And companies can't keep all the talent in-house because you, you need expertise in one area today and tomorrow you need expertise in another area. So this concept of the gig economy um, has really moved into corporations. So people want to rent instead of buy. So it's the demand for boutique professional services, kind of niche players in their, in their area um, is super, super high. So there's, it has never been a better time to try to scale a professional services business if that is your aspiration. In addition to that, because the world is flat now, we have access to talent and labor pools all over the place, which has traditionally been a major limitation on scalability. You know, I'm a a management consulting firm, and I'd like to hire 10 people, but I can't find them. Well, that's not true anymore. Um, there's actually networks you can plug into and uh, labor pools you can plug into like there's never been before. And then the third thing that's that's creating this unique combination of attributes that makes this a great time to be in the space is technology is changing everything. You know, normally when you're in the professional services business, the way you delivered was strictly labor, you know, some type of hour or billable hour. Today, you can productize your service and streamline it with technology, which allows infinite scalability. So if the labor component of service delivery is now below 50%, which it is, it used to be 100%, that allows you to do a lot more than you once were able to do. So um, for anyone who's listening that's in a lifestyle business and has had aspirations to do more than that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm telling you to go for it because the, the stars are lining up for you right now. So there... You've, you've, you're kind of saying a lot of what used to be significant challenges to scaling are kind of easier to deal with now, but there still must be significant challenges, right? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I'm, I'm not here to tell you that it's, that it's easy. Uh, it used to be impossible. I mean, that's the reason why only one quarter of 1% have, have actually done it. Uh, but, you know, in, in our um, company, Collective 54, which is a mastermind community, we've got several hundred boutiques in this community which is a wonderful laboratory. I get to um, witness, you know, what's happening out there. And just in the last six months, we've had seven exits. And these exits are life-changing, wealth-creating moments. That used to never happen. I mean, business, when, it, when, when the founders wanted to retire, they either 
handed the keys back to the landlord and just went on their way, or they handed the business over to the next generation. It was very, very unusual for this level of um, activity, acquisition activity, and that's happening now at an increasing rate. So it's, it's not as hard as it once was. Uh, it is difficult, but it's doable. Mm. So Greg, I love your cookbook analogy, and there's so much information in there. You know, say you have your typical business owner, he's got 20, 30 employees, but he really, he gets the idea, but where does he start? You know, if you're going to learn to cook, you know, it's helpful to have the chef go, hey, if I was you, I'd probably start with this or this, you know, no. how would they start? So the, my recommendation, the starting point is making sure that you're in the pain killing business, you're not in the vitamin business. Mm -hmm. Good. And you start with the client's problem and you work backwards in into that solving that problem a mistake to avoid is you come up with a solution and you run around looking for a problem that's that's uh not going to scale very well so you want that problem to be an urgent problem you want it to be pervasive meaning many people have it and you want to go after a set of clients that are willing to pay to solve the problem and in really tightening the definition of your problem statement or problem statements plural is a really important thing because what small business owners, particularly in the professional services space, are constrained by is three things. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so much money in the bank account. And there's only so many people on the org chart. So if you're misallocating those three precious resources by going after things that are not urgent and pervasive and customers are willing to pay for, you're in trouble. So really get tight on the problem you're going to solve. Now, this is a little counterintuitive, Corby, because sometimes people say, well, I want to go after a huge market. And I would tell you that the riches are in the niches. Just when you think your market's too small, make it smaller yep. because you can dominate that space and be the expert in that area. And that will generate referrals. It will generate positive word of mouth. It will build momentum for your business. So that's where I would start. Mm -hmm. No, and that, that actually leads me to another question is, you know, at times I think business owners can think they have to have a unique product or service that's different from anyone in the world versus targeting different clients. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I can speak to that uh, very clearly because so. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, what my firm was. So the, the firm that I started, scaled and sold was called SBI and that stands for Sales Benchmark Index. And we were a management consulting practice. I mean, right out of the central casting in every way, shape or form. And we were competing in the management consulting world of which is about 600,000 of those just in the US. So you would say, oh my goodness, like you can't win. Well, not true because we specialized in a very specific thing, which was business to business sales effectiveness. Yep. And our solution was an innovative approach, which was applying the science of benchmarking to the art of sales, which at that point had never been done before. So that was the twist. Yep. And we went after organizations. First off, they had to be B2B and they had to be a B2B organization heavily dependent on their sales force. So think of companies like um, Amazon Web Services or the advertising sales team at Google or, you know, even um, Hewlett Packard, you know, back in the day yeah. that had hundreds, if not thousands of salespeople. They were spending 20, 30 percent of their um, top line revenue just on sales expense. So that was a really so even a small incremental improvement there had a huge impact on company profitability. So that's what we went after. And we had a discipline, you know, if somebody called us up and said, hey, we're a consumer company or we sell through retail or distribution. We just, you know, we politely declined. If we were a small company, we had five salespeople, we would politely, politely decline. So we got really, really tightly focused on that and we became the leader in that niche. So that's an example of what I'm advocating for. So, so you're actually, actually saying they gotta say no to some business to yeah. get to the right business. Yeah, which is really hard, especially in the early days where all revenue is good revenue, right? But <laughs> eventually you become, what you sell. So, so if you're building up a client roster and it's a hodgepodge of clients, you know, all over the spectrum, then eventually you're going to become an undifferentiated commodity. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yes. So another, another question it, for you in your book, you both talk about going to market in the start, in the start section, then business development. Um, a lot of smaller businesses, the owner is, is the, they're the guy or the gal, right? Yeah. So when, 
when do they start? How do they actually make turn that corner to, to get there? Yeah, so we talk about the life cycle of a professional service firm. We say cradle to grave, it's about 15 years. Yeah. Five years in three stages, the growth stage, the scale stage, and the exit stage. And I'll define those three, and then that will allow me to answer your question. Mm -hmm. So the growth stage is roughly the first five years. Here, you're figuring out who your client's going to be, who your employee's going to be, what problem you're going to solve, what services you have, what's the business model, et cetera. Lots of experimentation there. Yeah. Then you get to the scale stage, and you pass that. And you said, okay, you know, we're no longer at risk of going out of business. You know, we've been growing nicely for several years, stable clients, stable employees, et cetera. But the 70-hour work week's getting old. So I got to work smarter, not harder. Yeah. And, then, and that's also five years, approximately year six to 10. And then there's the exit stage, which, which you guys are experts in. And that is, you know, I want to sell the firm because I want to do something else. So I want to retire. And very often in that stage, the, the firm itself is not a sellable asset for a lot of reasons. Yeah. So you've got to do things to make it, as you say, a transferable asset, right? And, and you guys know an awful lot about that. Yeah. And that's that stage. So your question was, is that the business development conundrum, right? So the, the awkward moment, is when you're leaving the growth stage and you're getting into the scale stage. And here's why that's awkward. And that's a, a limitation on scale. In the early days, you can farm your own personal network. Hmm. You know, the, the founder or founders know a bunch of people and they have good relationships and a track record with them. And they go to them and they say, here's what we're doing. And they get some business that way and they get a small number of clients. And then those clients are for other clients and, it's very um, kind of uh, a virtuous cycle, if you will. Yeah. And, and that's fine up to you know, X number of millions of dollars. And that, de de that X depends on the niche you're in. But eventually your network gets tapped out. Yeah. And even if it's growing, it's growing at a modest pace because I mean, I know a lot of people, but I'm only one person. So therefore I only know so many people. So then you have to start selling and delivering work to people you don't know or people that were not referred to you. And that's when you've got to build that, what I call a professional commercial sales engine. And that takes investment and it takes the creation of new core capability. And a lot of people get stuck there because they don't want to make the investment. They're afraid. I mean, given the choice, I can pull the, the money out of the business and stick it in my, my, the front pocket of my jeans, or I can pour it back into the business and invest in this thing called sales, which is scary. So they hit the pause button mm -hmm. and they don't do it. And they wonder why they're not growing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is those that are courageous and do it, they make several mistakes, which is inevitable when you're doing something for the first time. Yeah. And the mistakes are costly and painful and it shakes their confidence. So they stop. Those that make it through that and charge ahead and burn the bridges and say, hey, you know, I'm going forward on this thing. They eventually figure it out, and those are the ones that scale. Um, you know, and they next thing you know, you're sitting on a 200 person shop, and you're selling for 100 million. Yeah, man, that makes perfect sense. And and I would I would assume the implication then is, if they don't do that, they can hope to scale all they want, but they won't. Not going to happen. Yeah, they'll have a they'll have a nice business, very profitable. It'll grow at a modest rate, um, but with no ability to get, keep, and grow new customers consistently and with increasing volume over time. I mean, the, the law of numbers kicks in at some point. Yep. Yeah, so hey, uh, Greg, in your, in your, uh, in chapter 16, replication, the first paragraph says this, leaders of boutiques have a hard time replicating themselves and their employees. They're control freaks. <laughs> They would rather do something themselves than delegate it. They believe that the time it takes to teach, delegate is not worth it. It's just faster to do it themselves. If they do it, it will be done correctly. This attitude prevents scale. If not addressed, a boutique becomes a stagnant lifestyle business. Can you speak a little bit about replication, the challenges of it, and potential solutions or best practices? Because that's absolutely uh, um, a big major challenge. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and I, listen, I was able to write that chapter because I put my hand on the stove a bunch of times and made that mistake. So listen, scaling a firm is just flat out too much work for one person, mm -hmm. no way around it. So if you can't build a team and share the workload, you're not gonna scale. 
Now, how do you build the team and how do you share the workload? Well, you have to teach others to do what you do as well as you do it. There's just no way around that. I mean, eventually, if you don't do that, you as the founder or the owner, you become the bottleneck. There's only so much one person can do. And most founders and small business owners are extraordinary people that have tremendous high levels of personal productivity. But again, it's only one person. It's only 24 hours a day. I mean, what are you going to do? Work Christmas Day? I mean, there's, there's only, I mean, you got to sleep at night, right? I mean, there's only so many hours available. So you got to replicate yourself and others. So in my opinion, the best way to do that is embrace all of the, um, the body of knowledge around succession planning. And I'll, I'll do my best to dramatically simplify this here. But that starts with understanding your job in depth. And that's best done through a task analysis. So down to the task level. So what do I, Greg Alexander, as the owner of the business, what do I contribute to the business? And then when you look at those contributions, I circle the ones that I call key contributions. Because a lot of things that I do that are kind of cost of doing business items, and those immediately get delegated to somebody else because they're not necessarily life or death items. For example, running the back office. If you're a small business owner and you're still running the back office, you should have your head examined because that's an outsourceable activity <laughs> for inexpensive money. And there's people that just do that better than you do as an entrepreneur for sure. So things like that are easy. And if you're not doing that, listeners, you should go do that immediately. But when it comes to the key contributions and how you contribute, that's what you got to say to yourself. Okay, so how do I actually deliver this contribution and document it? So let's use an example. Cor Corby was asking me about sales. When I had my firm, I was the chief rainmaker for a number of years. So I started saying to myself, okay, so how am I doing it? How am I bringing in these new clients? And I documented everything from how I was generating leads, to how I converted a lead into an opportunity, to how I converted an opportunity into a paying client to how I turned that paying client into a long tenured client, to how I upsold that client or cross-sold that client. It was very detailed. And I documented it myself at first, almost like a, um, uh, an anthropologist might do, right? Where I literally almost like looked at myself down from above and, and said, this is what I do. Then I had this rough document and I hired a instructional designer. And I said, listen, turn this into courseware that an average person who hasn't walked in my shoes for the last number of years can actually take this course and learn how to do it. We did that next. Then we implemented employee certification. So for those people that wanted to rise up the ranks in our company and become a partner, it was a requirement that they had to bring in business to earn the right to be a partner. And the right to be a partner included equity, included distributions, elevated salaries. I mean, it was, it was the prize that these employees wanted to go for. So they, they would get certified. And then when they got certified, they would be labeled high potential employees. And we had a very specific development plan for high potential employees. Think of it as an apprenticeship model on steroids. And these people eventually became the leaders of the firm. So much so that when I sold my firm, and this is unusual, I didn't have an earnout, and I didn't have to roll any of my equity. The people that bought my firm said, Greg's irrelevant. He's no longer, the, the firm is no longer they don't need him anymore. So they, the person that took over for me, the, the, the uh, investors were so confident in his abilities based on how we developed him that they were willing to make a bet on him. You know, and this takes me to the stumbling block here. So that mechanically is how I did it. And that's not an invention by Greg Alexander. That's best practices of succession planning, widely popularized over several, several years. What's, what the obstacle is, is human nature. Entrepreneurs have their identity wrapped up in their business. They want to be the hero. And everybody wants to be needed. So making yourself irrelevant and obsolete is an unnatural act. Who wants to be irrelevant or obsolete? But, you know, as, as uh, the great saying was, is, you know, the, the, the best trick the devil ever pulled off is he convinced the world he didn't exist. And we, and we all know how that played out, right? So we've got to convince the company, the clients, the potential acquirer that you built a firm and you're only one person in that firm. And any firm can withstand the departure of a single person. Otherwise, it's not a firm if it can't. So getting over this hero syndrome is the real challenge. And that's the obstacle. So it takes a tremendous amount of self-awareness, 
um, the ability to self-regulate and to commit to this type of succession planning if you do want to exit your firm someday. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's fantastic. Okay, so we've got about another 10 minutes and I want to maximize it with talking about, well, first off, okay, so some key points there. To scale, they're going to have to replicate themselves. And, and the way they're going to do that is they're going to have to teach others. And then they're going to have to document. And I like I like your suggestion, suggestion there about hiring an instructional uh, designer to create courseware eventually to train to train everybody and what was in your head to begin with. We're always talking about that uh, in, in, in the work that we do and the processes that we go through. In that same chapter that I mentioned, replication, you, you, you know, we're always talking about management systems and the challenges that uh, professional services firms might face in management that maybe product or, or business uh, product firms don't face as much, or maybe they do, but it just looks different. And um, a statement you make in the same chapter, the unit of measure of profit for a healthy boutique is the project. And two things, maybe if you could explain what you meant by that statement, but then also that um, um, creates a question in my mind about management systems and projects. If project is going to be the measure of profit, would Agile as a management uh, process uh, work uh, yes. most effectively? Or, or is there another system that would work more effectively than Agile in, in working to scale a uh, boutique? Okay. So two questions there, Pat. I'll, and then let me take the first one first. So let's talk about profitability and why I believe the project is a unit of measure. So very often, small business owners, first off, they're measuring profitability incorrectly. It's at the firm level, which is in the aggregate, and that can be misleading, in my opinion. Plus, there, there isn't universally accepted principles around, for example, what's, what comes into the gross margin calculation. And our belief, gross margin is revenue minus the cost to deliver. So your direct labor cost associated with delivering the, the product. The, I'm sorry, excuse me, the service. And a good benchmark for your listeners is your gross margin should be around 80%. If they're not 80%, you're not charging enough and your labor costs are too high. And, and we have a benchmarking offering in Collective 54. That 80% number is not an opinion. That's based on the data that we've collected from our membership across you know, lots and lots of professional services firms. Then what comes out of the gross margin line to the EBITDA line is your overhead and your sales and marketing costs. Because in a professional services group, you don't have costs of goods sold. You don't have an engineering department. You just have your sales and marketing costs and your overhead number. So your EBITDA number should be around 50%. So there's 30% coming out of the gross margin number in sales and marketing costs and overhead costs. If it's more than that, then acquiring customers is too expensive and your overhead number is bloated. So you should be able to run a business at a 50% EBITDA number. Now, how do you reverse engineer, re reverse engineer yourself into that? So let's say you're managing profit at the firm level. So immediately stop doing that. Then you take it down to the client level. And a lot of times people think that's the proper measure. The challenge with that is most client relationships in professional services compose of multiple projects. And some projects are profitable and some projects are not profitable. It's kind of like if you think, if you draw an analogy to a product company, if I'm a product company, I sell 10 products. I'm going to make money on some and maybe not so much on others, right? So you got to think about projects in that context. And the way you calculate project profitability is very simple. You have your scope of work. They paid you X amount of money to deliver that scope. You resourced it based on that. And you were either on time, on spec, and on budget. And therefore, your profit target was met or you weren't. And when you're not, what you have to ask yourself the question is, this is the biggest reason why people miss these profit targets is they have senior people doing junior work. So let's say your internal bill rate for a senior person is, I don't know, $150 an hour. And they're doing work that a junior person can do if the work was spec'd correctly at 50 bucks an hour. Because in professional services, that's how you make your money. You sell something for $1,000 and it costs you $100 to deliver and 900 bucks is your margin. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, of course. But if you have senior people, those are your most expensive people doing junior work, then you're eroding profitability right there. There's a concept in professional services called the leverage ratio. 
And the leverage ratio is simply um, how many um, billable resources can a partner keep busy? So for example, if I'm a partner and I'm keeping 10 people busy, then my leverage ratio is 10 to one. So the design of the service and these concepts like replicating myself through others through employee certification is what allows me to get a high leverage ratio. I can sell something to a client that has very high value, but because I've codified it and made it a repeatable service offering, junior people, and junior doesn't mean non-skilled, but it might mean junior to you that costs me less, they can do the work with high client satisfaction. And that's the spread that I can capture. And that's why it's so important to measure profitability in that fashion at the project level. Mm -hmm. And then when the numbers are off at the project level, you can reverse engineer it and say, why did that happen? You know, why are senior people doing junior work? And it's a great diagnostic tool, in my view, uh, to be able to spot the problem. Now, the second part of your question is agile. So my firm at SBI, we had a delivery methodology called Agila Trust. And it was literally the marrying of two words, agile and trust. And we wanted the customer to trust us based on how we did work. And we use that as a differentiator against the big firms because the big firms were largely waterfall based, meaning very sequential. And when you're a waterfall based uh, delivery mechanism, things take long, cost a lot. It's inflexible. It's a bad client experience because every time something goes wrong in a project and it always does, it requires a change of scope and new costing. And the client starts to feel like, geez, I'm getting nickel and dime. You know, they constantly hear, well, that wasn't in scope. You know, we're gonna add it to the scope and here's another bill. And they don't like that. If you build your projects in an agile format, which is basically rapid iteration, and it's, it's, it's built to have closed loop feedback cycles along the way, you never really get in trouble. Everything starts with the formation of a hypothesis then there's experiment to test a hypothesis. And then there's data that comes out of that experiment, which then allows you to do the iteration. So for example, when we would deliver something for a client, <clears throat> we would have a hypothesis. We would, we would set up an experiment that would last no longer than a week. And we had very clear pass-fail criteria on what the hypothesis was. It was either proven to be true or untrue. And based on that learning, we would develop a new set of hypotheses. And if you carry that out through the entire project, your rate of learning and your rate of flexibility goes up dramatically. So you end up delivering the result to the client in a fraction of the time. And in professional services, time is money. So if I'm competing with a big firm and they got a proposal on the table for a million dollars, I can deliver the same work with higher quality and half the cost. And yet my fees aren't any lower. I just get done a lot faster because I'm agile. And clients received that extremely well. Um, and, and that was their justification to go with a smaller firm. You know, very often people go with a big firm as kind of a CYA effort, if you know what I mean by that. You know, I, I hired, you know, we used to say no one got fired for hiring IBM. Today they say, you know, no one ever, no one ever got fired for, by hiring McKinsey. Well, so if you're going to not hire the McKinsey's and you're going to go with a smaller firm, you're exposed a little bit. So you've got to show them that there's a real benefit in doing so. And being agile is one of many benefits that a boutique brings to a client. Mm -hmm. Greg, that raises a question, though, uh, just in terms of pricing. Yeah. It seems like pricing could really become a challenge in an agile environment. How did you think about that? Yeah. So our belief was pricing comes down to scoping. Mm -hmm. And this goes to Pat's question around a management system. And this is part of a management system. So these things are related to one another. So because you're super tight on the problem you solve, the type of client you, you serve, your internal knowledge base on the level of effort it's going to take to perform a piece of work goes up dramatically. Yeah. So when you, when you put a price on the table, you know that even in an agile environment, here's the range. You know, yeah. it's gonna, the level of effort is going to be anywhere from, I don't know, 200 hours to 300 hours. And that's based on the last five projects we've done just like this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in the beginning, you don't know what that is, yeah. right? So you are guessing a little bit, and that's okay. But the lesson for your listeners here is to make sure that you're doing a post-project review after every single project. And you're going back and you're look, looking at the way you design the project and the level of effort estimates, the profitability target, and you say, were we right or were we not right? And based on what we learned, you roll that into the next project, and that's how you build up your management system, if you will, 
that's one component of it, how to scope and price work. That's how you use data collected in a systematic way, post project review, review after every project that builds those types of systems. Yeah, no, it makes sense. It, it actually explains why it, it was an aha moment where your gross margins are 80%. That means 20% of the cost goes to producing the work. Your overhead is actually higher. I know. Than your production cost, which yeah. is counterintuitive. It is. Well, for a growing firm that's entering the scale states, there's heavy expense on sales and marketing. Yeah. Yep. In fact, I would say if there's a 30 point hit from gross margin to even margin, I'd say probably 80% of that is in sales and marketing. Mm. And, you know, and 20% is in overhead. I mean, as you guys know, overhead stays flat, which is a good yeah. thing usually. But if you're really trying to grow, then you're investing in sales and marketing. And that's where the big number is. Yeah, makes perfect sense. All right, fantastic. So <clears throat> Walter's going to wrap us up here in a second. And um, he, he's going to ask you, Greg, if there's anything that you want to promote today. But I want to promote your book. It's fantastic. <laughs> Everything that we've talked about today is in here and, and more. And uh, so listeners, rather than me or, or Corby or Walter recapping key points, we would just say, get the book and then listen to this podcast again. It's just a fantastic um fantastic help here um so thank you greg appreciate you joining us walter i know you're going to wrap us up okay greg this has been fantastic we look forward to having you back because i think uh listeners you're going to be you're going to be an in-demand uh, guest for us so we'll, we'll try to accommodate that for our listeners benefit um like pat mentioned you know the book is fantastic is there anything else you'd like to promote today and can you tell us how listeners can get can get in contact with you yeah, the, the easiest thing to do would be to go to collective54.com and 54 is the number 54.com. And, and that's our mastermind community for founders and leaders of boutique professional services firms. So if you're not in professional services, we'll be irrelevant to you. So I apologize for that. But if you are in professional services and you're in that kind of five to 250 employee range, then it would be highly relevant. You can also find the book there. So if you want to buy it there, we'll be happy. And if you buy it on that site, I'll sign it for you and send you a little note. If you buy it from Amazon, I have no idea where it's going. So it's tough to personalize it. Um, there's also a podcast on there. So anyone's listening to this probably enjoys podcasts. You might check that out. And then if you're interested in joining a community of peers in learning from peers that are dealing with the same issues that you are and, and implementing the types of things we talked about on the call today, then uh, becoming a member of Collective 54 is something that you should consider. Fantastic. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it would be very, very beneficial. Thanks so much for joining us today. It was, it was really fantastic. Okay, guys, I appreciate uh, you having me on. And listeners, if you want help in maximizing the value of your business or planning for your eventual exit, you can reach Pat and Corby at 301-859-0860. And you can reach me at 301-951-9090. You can also access resources at readiness, exitreadiness.com, grfcpa.com, and nslp.com. And as always, thank you for listening. And until next time on the Exit Readiness Podcast, this is Walter Dial and Pat Ennis signing off. <laughs>